Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Crystal Levesque, a swine nutrition professor at South Dakota State University. So Crystal, before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself? Sure. Um, so I actually hail from Canada. I'm a Canadian and, and grew up in the western province of Saskatchewan. We had, um, well, at, at that time, in the 70s and early 80s, we had about 50,000 broilers, which was really big in Saskatchewan. We were, we were the big producers, not so much anymore, but um, we had about 120 head of cattle and, and I think we had about 1,200 acres. So um, my dad was a busy guy. Um, but one of the, I think one of the things that I maybe learned earliest on the farm was um, my, my dad had very little patience for a lot of different things, but when it came to livestock, that was different. And we learned it was different in the barn. And I, I guess it was just a family thing. And, um, again, back way back then was at least in Canada anyway, kind of the era of when animal activists started to become, a, a greater reality you know they've they've been around for probably a long time but it it started to come and hit really close to home and so my mom joined was one of the initial individuals on a um i don't even remember what it was called anymore but it it was an organization developed by the poultry industry particularly the broilers but by the poultry industry in saskatchewan to help the producers learn how to communicate to somebody other than themselves, right? And what's the importance of it? Why does it matter that the person in the local grocery store does not understand what you do? Why does it matter that they're not really quite so quick to just trust anymore? So anyways, those are... I. Um, gotten off I guess of where I'm from but or what I do but um, after three children and getting them off to school I went back to school and and did my master or my bachelor's and my master's and took a short hiatus to run or open a restaurant and then went back for my PhD and yes yeah, so I got a really crooked path to where I am but it's been good learned lots of lessons along the way yep so like you kind of mentioned already and you're bringing it up there's it is difficult sometimes to um, communicate some of our scientific and agricultural knowledge to people who are have less of that background or just in general less interest. Um, and you've had plenty of graduate students and we've both been graduate students ourselves. So from your experiences, what would you then say is like one of the better ways or some tips that you can keep in mind when trying to train graduate students to communicate better um, the scientific knowledge to non-academic audiences. Yeah, I I think one of the biggest things we need to do as supervisors is we need to understand how to do that. Because it's really hard to train somebody else to do it if you haven't spent the time. And I'm I'm fully aware that there are a limited number of hours in our day and lots of things to do. But we we really there are components within our job where we're having to do that anyway, right? I mean, we teach. Most of us are teaching in some way, shape, or form. Well, that's really communicating to a non-scientific audience, right? And so learning, we, we already do some aspects of it. And so I think one of the, well, as I said, the, one of the biggest things that we need to do is make sure that we are always learning better. And the best way to do that is just go and do it. Right. I mean, there's lots of training. There's different training programs that you can use and they're great. But taking a training program and not doing anything with it. That doesn't help you. Right. So just go do it. Yeah. And I think also part of it, too, is just like it's, it's sometimes scientific knowledge can be a bit, uh, quote unquote, boring for people who have less interest in it. And so I think one of the biggest challenges, and I'm saying this especially for myself, because I don't even know how many of my family members watch this podcast, but <laughs> making scientific knowledge exciting um, can yeah. be difficult. 
Yeah. Um, so kind of how, how would you say then is like one of the, the better ways to um, make it exciting and intriguing for people who have less of an initial background? Well, most people are excited about what they do. Most people like what they do. And so, you know, if that, if, if your enjoyment of that topic comes out in the way you converse with somebody, they get caught up in the same thing. Right. I mean, it's, I, I was, I've, I've got a range of grandchildren already, but I think about the the youngest ones. I, I mean, I remember when they were all really little and they come back from anywhere could simply have been something as simple as the grocery store. Right. They just, they learned something and they were so excited to, to tell you about it. Right. So, you know, we, there are ways that we can explain things in an exciting way without being, oh my gosh, they're going to go through this explanation again. Like, really, do we have to talk science? <laughs> um, but you can do that in, you know, a fun way. Yeah. And it can be, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of also part of it's just kind of reading your audience as well and seeing what parts of it, I think, and interest them because certain parts of it might, you know, certain parts of the swine environment, whether it be nutrition or reproduction or whatever might interest them more than others. So kind of, I think listening to what they ask more questions about and then focusing more on those can kind of help uh, too. Well, certainly, certainly knowing who you're talking to, right. And, and the, one of the best ways to figure that out is to ask them questions, Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, what are, why are you sitting in this, this seat next to me on the plane or, Right. You can just start a general conversation with somebody to learn who they are. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But then there's a, a certain instance where you might learn a little bit more and then learn that there may be, like you mentioned earlier, more of a on the activist spectrum where um, whether it might, might not be as aggressive, but they're kind of prone to automatically disagree with anything you might say just based on the work or the field of work that we work in. Um, so when kind of talking with someone like that, I mean, obviously if it's not a full blown argument, but when talking with someone like that, who kind of already has a disposition against uh, animal agriculture, what um, recommendation would you give for kind of dealing with that situation? Yeah. And, and that could be tough. Most, I would say probably most of the time there is some piece of animal agriculture that you can agree on. Even if it comes down to you, you know, the, the individual that you're talking to probably is really passionate about making sure that the animals are being respected. Right. I mean, most of the time, that's where we're, that's where people come from. Well, we want animals to be treated appropriately. Well, we can agree on that. I absolutely feel the same way. I want animals to be treated appropriately. How we define that maybe is different. It's hard to ask animals. Right. But we we can't let's I mean, we can agree on that. Absolutely. Right. We, we can at least agree on that point that that's both of our goals is to treat animals appropriately. Now, if they say, well, I'm you know not really interested in eating meat. OK. Right. Um, you don't you know, I, that's OK. I don't you know, that's you. You have that choice. So most of the time there's some, even if it's a small thing, something that you can agree on. And then the rest of the stuff, you just kind of have to agree to disagree. But hearing them out doesn't help to argue, right? Hearing them out is probably your best course of action. Yeah, I think that's a good point. That kind of does go back to, listen, you know, like you said, like we said before, just knowing your audience, reading the audience and kind of identifying those points that you can maybe agree on to calm the situation a little bit, um, especially if it does, if they do get more heated and um, argumentative. But um, yeah, so I guess um, my final question then is um, in terms of graduate students, and I mean, they're, they're just entering the scientific ac- uh, academia field. And like you said, they've, it's like a, a kid going someplace for the first time where they're all excited and they want to share everything they've learned um, with their family members and their friends. Um, So where would you say they struggled the most 
and uh, communicating that knowledge? Um, from like speaking with others outside of their field or? Yeah, outside of, uh, you know, non-academic audiences or parents who they might have grown up in the city, um, whoever it may be. But like, because, I mean, there is that struggle and we've talked a little bit about that struggle in terms of like making it exciting and everything. But just in terms of effectively communicating what they learned without making it boring and also making it understandable. Um, do you think there's a specific area um, that graduate students or younger graduate students tend to struggle with more with that communication? I, I would say maybe it lies in two areas. Um, one would be knowing when to stop. So that, I mean, I mean, we get excited and we just talk and talk and talk and okay, stop, but they're not <laughs> anymore. Um, but the other one would be, again, even with family, figuring out what's that sort of common denominator that you can then build from, right? So, you know, when I was in grad school, my my parents didn't know anything about stable isotopes. I was using them all the time. But they did know about sows and baby pigs. So it was at least a place where we could start. I want to feed the sows better to get really strong pigs. Oh, okay, yeah, they could track with that, right? Well, how how might you do that? So you, you start somewhere that you've got a common denominator and you can build from there. No one to quit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it can be a little overwhelming for any amount of information that anyone receives at any point. So, yep. L-Biotics, the pioneer postbiotic for digestive health in pigs. Brought to you by Adair Biome. With over a century of experience in postbiotics for digestive health, L-Biotics contains heat-treated lactobacillus cell bodies and their metabolites. Stable by nature, L-Biotics can be easily stored and incorporated in compound feed. Well, I believe that's all we have time for, Crystal, but thank you again for coming on the show and uh, sharing all of this with us. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Yep. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swan Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey everyone, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Oh.